is August 24th, 2001. A fairly new Airbus A330 is about to take a rather long flight from Toronto Airport in Canada all the way to Lisbon Airport in Portugal. It's about 9 p.m. local time, but we're gonna use UTC for consistency throughout this video. This is a massive plane. We've got 13 crew members managing this flight and 293 passengers making this journey. Boarding goes normally and this plane proceeds to take off from the airport with 47.9 metric tons of fuel. Just to be clear, this is not only enough fuel to make the journey, but there's about 5.5 metric tons of extra fuel that they expect to have when they land. There's one more important feature worth discussing about this plane, and that is it's a fly-by-wire plane. When the pilot moves the stick in the cockpit, he's actually sending an electrical signal to a computer, which is in turn sending commands to a hydraulic system that actually moves the control surfaces of the plane. Having said that, there are two mechanical backup systems. There are rudder pedals, which allow the plane to move in this direction, and then there's a trim wheel, which allows the plane to sort of pitch up and down. So why is this important? Because in a few hours, this plane is gonna run out of fuel in the middle of the ocean. Running out of fuel means we have lost our engines, the generators connected to those engines also stop. So we've lost our primary source of electrical power. And because the APU in the back of the plane is also a mini jet engine, you've lost all electrical power. So we don't have any displays, we don't have any radios, we've lost most of our control over this plane and the cockpit is dark. This is a terrifying situation that is not sustainable. And yet there is one more trick up the engineer's sleeve. Today we're gonna to find out what happened to the 300 plus people hurtling through the sky at several hundred miles an hour, as well as this ingenious invention, which gave them their displays back, gave them their radio back, and mostly pretty good control of the plane, allowing them to glide for another 65 miles. And we are not talking about batteries. Let's get started. Hey, future Jeremy butting in here. Before I start the story sequence, I wanna add two quick technical notes. The footage you're about to see is my best attempt to tell the story, even though I'm gonna be using footage from different planes and obviously planes from different decades. So everything won't match perfectly. Speaking of things not matching perfectly, while researching this, I found several news articles that got some details wrong here and there. But I am basing everything in this video on the final report. In fact, I'm gonna put a link to the final report in the description so you can read it for yourself. And that includes the use of the term flight director to refer to the lead flight attendant. So you might be more familiar with lead flight attendant and when you hear me say flight director, that's who I'm talking about. Okay, I think I've covered all my caveats. Let's jump into this story. For the first four hours of flight, everything's pretty normal. It's the middle of the night, passengers are sleeping in the back, and even up in the cockpit, everything seems to be normal. That is until 503 UTC. This is when they notice that they've got an unusually high oil pressure reading in engine number two, as well as an unusually low temperature reading for engine number two. Looking from the pilot's perspective, engine number two is the one on the right. Neither of these numbers are completely out of the normal range, but it's definitely unusual to get both of them together, and they're clearly very different and what we're seeing in engine number one. They decide to report this information by jumping on their high frequency radio and reporting this back to their maintenance control center. They've been busy puzzling over this oil pressure warning for a while, not realizing that another alert has been showing on a different display. At 5.33, the crew navigates away from the screen showing the oil pressure warning, only to find that there's another warning that's been waiting behind it. This is a warning indicating a fuel imbalance between the right and left tanks in the wings. What they didn't realize at the time is that a fuel line had ruptured in engine number two due to a maintenance error. The wrong part was installed in the plane and that caused a hydraulic line to rub against the fuel line. If you wanna find out more about what exactly went wrong in the maintenance department and how they end up installing the wrong part, I'm gonna put a link to the full report in the description. There's one more maintenance issue worth pointing out, and that is the maintenance department did indeed do a test run on the ground. In fact, the plane flew for about 65 hours before this rupture took place. It turns out that once the hydraulic line was under pressure, then it would rub against the fuel line. 65 hours of rubbing together caused that fuel line to rupture, and now we've got huge amounts of fuel pouring out of this line and flowing directly into the oil heat exchanger. Now you're probably aware that most of the fuel is stored in the wings of the plane, but the part you may not have considered is that at 35 to 40,000 feet, the temperature is extremely cold. We're talking about minus 40 degrees C to minus 70 degrees C. That super chilled air is flowing over the wings, cooling off the fuel. Now we're dumping this super cold fuel into the heat exchanger, and that's why we've got these weird 
or pressure readings. Now the whole point of the oil heat exchanger is to remove some of the heat that was built up from flowing through the engines before it goes back into the engines. But in this case, we've cooled it off a lot more than normal. That oil that used to be nice and hot and flowing is now like a sludge or almost like peanut butter trying to squeeze through these pipes Thus, the pressure is much higher. The pilots, of course, don't realize that these two alerts are related. In fact, they have no idea that there's a fuel leak at all. According to the final report, this type of warning is extremely rare. In fact, the only time you ever see it is in training when there's an engine failure and that engine is no longer drawing out of the tank right behind it, but the other engine is still drawing down its tank. One of the issues this creates is you've got a weight imbalance in the plane where this wing is much heavier than the other wing, which is running lower on fuel. So in this case, if we shut down the right engine, after a while, it's the right tank that's gonna have more fuel than the left tank. And you can compensate for that by having the left engine draw out of the right tank for a little while. This is what typically ends up happening in those simulations. In order to do this procedure properly, there's a checklist that the pilots are supposed to follow. However, they had done this so many times in training, they just went into autopilot, so to speak, and did it from memory. They never looked at their checklist. This was a pivotal moment in the flight because if he had reviewed his checklist, he would have seen a huge cautionary note at the top which said, confirm that you don't have a fuel leak first and there's a separate checklist for the checking for fuel leaks. Instead, what they ended up doing is what they're used to doing in training. Because it's the right tank that's running low, they decide to shut off the right tank and they open a cross feed valve which allows fuel from the left tank to flow over to the right engine. So at the moment, both engines are running off of the left tank, he's now bleeding down his left tank. Thinking that they've resolved the issue, they continue flying the plane. At 5.45, they realize they don't have enough fuel to make it to their destination. Now, every flight, especially these oceanic flights, they have a contingency plan in case there are emergencies. You know, if you have a medical emergency or something on the plane is failing and you need to get this plane down in a hurry, uh, you need to have a plan for where you're going to land. And it turns out that at this stage of the flight, there's this little island airport that's about 900 miles short of their destination. And this is their diversionary airport at this stage of the flight. They reach out to air traffic control and let them know that they're having a fuel issue and they are allowed to divert to this airport. At this stage, they've only got about seven metric tons of fuel left. About this same time, the flight director comes to the front of the plane to let the pilots know that we've got a handicapped passenger on board and we're gonna need special accommodations when it comes time to get off at our destination. But of course, at this point, they know we're not gonna make it to our destination and they tell the flight director, go back and prepare the cabin for a diversionary landing where we're having a fuel issue. The flight director spreads the word to the rest of the crew. They begin putting away tray tables. They put the gallery equipment away. It's only been about five minutes when the flight director returns to the cockpit to find out that things are much more desperate at this point. The numbers are dropping just way too fast. They tell the flight director, go back and look and see if you can see anything, any kind of mist or anything coming out from under the wings of the plane. She does this, she goes to the back, they even turn down the lights, but of course, it's the middle of the night. So if you're looking at the wing in the dark over the ocean, you're not gonna see very much. And that's what they report. We looked, we didn't see any fuel leak, but of course, it's really dark out there. By the time she makes it back to tell them that they don't see any fuel leaking, the pilots tell her something you never wanna hear a pilot say. Prepare the cabin, we may have to dish this thing in the ocean. They've got about seven tons of fuel left and at the current rate of loss, there's no way they're gonna make it even to their diversionary airport. Remember that they were expecting to land with 5.5 extra tons of fuel. The pace in the cockpit is definitely picking up at this point. They switch from draining the right tank over to draining the left tank. And finally, when they're down to 1.1 tons of fuel, they open up all the tanks to get as much distance as they can before this plane turns into a glider. They're pretty sure that they have a fuel leak somewhere in the plane, but they have run out of options to fix it at this point. At 613, they're at flight level 390 or 39,000 feet, and they're still 150 miles away from the island when the first engine flames out. I have to say, this must be a terrifying moment for the passengers. You've just been told by the flight attendants that you're gonna be ditching in the ocean. You're hearing them describe how to put on the life jackets, how to brace yourself. They're doing this in multiple languages. Then suddenly the lights are flickering in the cabin, and you can hear that right engine spooling down as the noise level outside is literally cut in half. Now that they're only flying on one engine, they're not able to maintain that 39,000 feet. And so the pilots had to sacrifice some height 
are coming down to 34,500 feet. At 626 UTC, they've got 65 miles left to go when the left engine flames out and the outside of the cabin goes quiet. Because they've exhausted all of their fuel, the generators shut down and the cabin goes dark, flipping on the floor emergency lights which are running off of the batteries. Airplanes are designed with many redundant backup systems, and that's because you can't just pull over on the side of the road and wait for a tow truck. You are literally hurtling through the air at several hundred miles per hour, and you've got a busload of people riding along with you. It's also true that when you've got a plane as complex as this, you've got thousands of mechanical parts, and it's pretty much inevitable that one of them is gonna break eventually. Therefore, if you have a backup system for all of the critical systems that allow you to fly, like redundant electrical systems and redundant hydraulic systems, such that if any one of those systems fail, you can still safely fly the plane. In the vast majority of cases, the backup system takes over so smoothly, the passengers are never even aware that there was a problem and you can even continue on to your destination. But there's one Achilles heel to many of these electrical and hydraulic systems that require a power source. You've got to have power from somewhere. And in this case, the critical system is the jet engine. All of your generators that create electrical power are powered by your jet engine. The hydraulic motors that pressurize your hydraulic system are often being powered by your jet engine. So if your jet engines fail, then all of these other systems can fail. So if you have an engine problem, you need to have a backup jet engine. And that's what these big commercial airliners have. You can still fly this plane even with just one engine remaining and put this thing safely on the ground. But there's one Achilles heel to all of your jet engines and that's the fuel system. So if you've got a case where the fuel is contaminated and not burning properly, or you are leaking fuel, which is what is happening back here in 2001, or the pilots make an error and they don't put the right amount of fuel on the plane. Any of these scenarios can lead to all of your engines shutting down at the same time, giving you a total power failure. This is a particularly sensitive issue for the fly-by-wire plane. When you're in a plane that doesn't use a fly-by-wire system, that is a plane where you've got cables or even hydraulic systems directly connecting the yoke directly to the flight surfaces, those planes go from powered flight to being basically a glider. The pilot can still keep the plane level and a, a trained pilot should be able to get that plane safely on the ground. But a fly-by-wire plane will lose that connection because the computer in between that's receiving the digital inputs has shut off. So to keep a reasonable amount of control over this plane, it's essential that the electrical system be in control long enough to get this plane safely on the ground. Well, engineers thought about this problem and it turns out that there's another source of energy inside of this plane and it's not the battery, it's actually all of the kinetic energy of the plane itself. This thing is not only 40,000 feet up in the air, it's also moving forward at several hundred miles per hour. If we had a way of converting that kinetic energy into energy, electrical energy inside of the plane, we can get control back of the plane. And that's where the RAT comes in, or the Ram Air Turbine. The Ram Air Turbine is basically a windmill in pretty much exactly the same way that windmills capture the energy of the wind that's flowing over them. We have dropped this windmill down into the jet stream to capture the air flowing over the body of this plane, recapturing some of that kinetic energy that we built up with our jet engines, getting it up to this speed and this height is how we're going to get back control of this airplane. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, wait a minute, Jeremy, if you can use windmills on an airplane to capture some of that energy and use it inside of the plane, why can't we use this all of the time? You should have windmills all over the place and that'll help you save fuel and that will you know, power electronics or something. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work that way. You see, there is always an energy trade-off. First of all, once you drop something down into the airstream, it's gonna create drag, which will slow the plane down wasting more fuel. This is why airplanes are designed to be as sleek as possible so that they can slip through the air very efficiently saving fuel. But what about the energy that we get off of it? Is it more than enough to compensate for the drag? Not even close. In fact, we're gonna lose even more energy trying to create energy. And let me explain. Anytime you try to convert from one form of energy to another, in this case, we want to go from the kinetic energy of the plane ultimately to electricity, which is going to power our electronics but that transformation is gonna waste a little bit of the energy. Like we can't get around losing a little bit in the process. Probably the easiest way to understand what's happening here is just to follow the flow of energy and see how it's transformed and where it goes. In this case, we're gonna first fill our airplane with jet fuel. 
This is a perfectly functional airplane. There's nothing wrong with it. We want to convert this chemical energy stored in the liquid into something more useful. In this case, thrust. We want to push this airplane off of the ground, taking our passengers where we want them to go. So the motion is the part that's important to us, right? We're going to use our engine to make that conversion. The engine is going to convert this chemical energy into something more useful. Inside of the engine, we're going to start a fire. So we're releasing some heat. We are sucking in air by spinning the turbine in the front, compressing the air and throwing it out of the back. Ultimately, that's going to give us the thrust to push this plane off of the ground. But it's not just giving us thrust, right? We were getting some motion. Yes, that's where some of the energy goes. But we're also spinning bearings and moving a lot of very heavy parts and wasting some energy as friction, right? And if you've ever stood next to a jet engine or really any engine, if you've ever lifted the hood of your car after it's been running for a while, there's a heck of a lot of heat as well. I didn't do a very good job of spreading out the distribution of energy, but you get the idea. We've got heat energy, we've got friction, and then we've got the part that we want, the motion. Now the heat and friction, that energy is just wasted. We can't get that energy back. We spill it in the process, right? But this motion is the part that's going to deliver us to where we want to go. Now here's where things get interesting. While we're flying through the air, there's another element called drag, which is also slowing the plane down, using up some of our kinetic energy. So even this kinetic energy as we fly through the air is being wasted little bit by little bit, right? We're dripping a little bit of this kinetic energy all along the way in the form of loss speed. The plane is slowing down. To maintain our speed, we're going to need to take some more jet fuel, dump it back into our engine, and then take that energy, jump, dump it into kinetic energy. We're going to dump some into friction. You follow where this is going, right? So we're going to need a continual flow of jet fuel in order to keep this process going. Even once we're in the air, we still need more energy. Probably the most important message you can get from this is there is no way to create new energy, right? There's no free energy. We're going to be making a conversion for each stage of the process. And each conversion is also wasting a little bit of the energy. There's another very common comment I get in nearly every video where this topic of energy comes up. And that is, what if you use a mechanical device like gears or pulleys to multiply the speed output or multiply the force output or torque output, wouldn't that increase your power? And it's best to think of gears as being just another cup or better yet, they're kind of like an engine. They convert the energy that's being put in and the output is going to be some energy level slightly less than what went in because of losses to friction and so on. If we wanted to add more gears and pulleys to the system, we would just be adding another step, more parts to break, and more places to lose energy. So if those components aren't essential to the operation of the device, it's best not to add them. I have a whole video dedicated to how gears and pulleys work. So if you want a deeper understanding of what exactly happens when you add a gear or add pulleys to a system, you can check out that video. I'll put a link in the description. So let's go back to our flight scenario where we have built up some kinetic energy getting this plane up into the air and we want to get some of this kinetic energy back. Well, that's where the rack comes in. In this case, we've got a plane hurtling through the air very fast, which is creating a wind over all of its surfaces. And we can capture some of that artificial wind, if you will, put that into our rack. And then the rack is a converter, just like the engines creating electrical energy, creating hydraulic power inside of our systems to keep this plane running. And this brings up a really interesting engineering challenge because we want to siphon off some of our kinetic energy to be converted by the ram air turbine into another form of useful energy. In this case, electrical power and hydraulic power. But we still need to maintain some of our kinetic energy. We need to maintain a certain speed in the air to keep this plane flying. Once we drop below a certain speed, we no longer have enough lift to keep the plane in the air. In other words, this plane would turn into a rock and fall straight out of the sky at some speed where we have stalled or run out of enough wind over the wings in order to keep this plane afloat. So I think it's a really interesting sort of engineering problem. How do you decide what's the minimum size that you need in order to keep this thing in the air? Why do you want the minimum size? Well, because you want to give the pilots as much time in the air as possible to find a safe place to land. How do we stay in that zone as long as possible? We basically want to get the minimum flight controls 
We want the pilot to be able to talk to air traffic control so they, we can let them know that we're coming in. And we need to have at least a couple of displays showing what's going on. And that's essentially what happens. Everything inside of the cabin goes off. The only systems that will remain on is the emergency lighting. We're gonna have a few displays so that the pilots can have just enough awareness of what their plane is doing in order to safely land this plane. Another system that gets sacrificed is cabin pressurization. You know, we don't have enough energy to keep this thing up at a level where you can't breathe anyway. So we're gonna let the oxygen mass fall down from the ceiling, which is what happened in this case. The passengers can breathe long enough for us to get this plane down to a level where they can breathe again, and then you can remove your mask. The engineers are not concerned about creature comforts at this point. We are concerned about saving the lives of these people. There's yet another downside to making the rat larger, and that is it's heavier and takes up more space. When you increase the weight of the rat, you're also increasing the weight of the entire plane, which is gonna reduce your fuel economy. You're gonna reduce the amount of fuel that you can carry or the amount of cargo space because somewhere you are sacrificing space to make room for this rat and something is gonna be given up in order to get that space back. And also keep in mind that this is a backup system. The hope is that this thing will fly for 30 years and never actually use this system. This is the sort of baggage that you wanna to keep to a bare minimum, that is weight and size, to ensure it's just barely big enough to get the job done in case of an emergency. There's yet another interesting engineering challenge when using a Ram Air turbine. We need a way of controlling the actual wind turbine without changing the speed of the plane. I mean, the pilots can slow the plane down, but they can't speed it up. And obviously slowing the plane down to this point is a terrible idea, right? They could lower their flaps and increase the drag of the plane, but now you're reducing how much time you have in the air to find your airport and land safely. In the Airbus A330, it has a hydraulic motor that's being powered by the wind turbine. And so if the pressure in that system is too high, the hydraulic pressure is too high, that's a problem. If the hydraulic pressure is too low, you don't have enough to keep the system moving along. So how do you get the right speed? Well, the system actually controls itself, which is really fascinating. And it does so by controlling the pitch of the blade. If the pressure gets too high, the blades automatically rotate in proportion to the pressure in the system. And if the pressure gets too low, the reverse happens and they automatically tilt back again in proportion to the amount of pressure in the system. It's really fascinating. Speaking of automatically, the rat actually deploys fully automatically without any intervention from the pilots. Now, the pilots can force it to deploy. There's a button that they can push to get the rat to deploy. But as you can imagine, the pilots are under a lot of stress at this point, and there are many different systems that are starting to fail, needing the pilots' attention. So the more things that we can get to happen with automation, the easier it's gonna be for these pilots to maintain control of the situation. Now, different planes are gonna have different conditions to deploy their rat, but for the Airbus A330, for example, if the engine power is below 50% and the plane's flying over 100 knots, and there's a couple other parameters, when all of these things are in place, the rat will deploy fully automatically. Now, you might be thinking, how is the computer gonna know to deploy the rat if the computer's not working? You know, we just lost all engine power. Well, that's where the batteries come in. The batteries will power this system while we are in this transition. It comes on automatically the same way the emergency lights come on. The electrical backup system will keep the computers running until the rat is fully deployed. Ideally, you don't want to rely fully on the electrical though because you've only got about 20 to 30 minutes of time before you run those batteries down. So the rat will give us power, letting us conserve our battery power until we get closer to landing. At that point, the plane is starting to slow down, the rat's becoming less effective, and if the rat stops working or stops assisting us, the backup electrical system can kick back in and we can preserve that electrical backup system as long as possible. Before we get back to our story in progress, it's worth mentioning one more time that not all airplanes need a ram air turbine. This is primarily a system designed for the fly-by-wire airplane. And I hope that this is bringing up one more interesting question for many of you, and that's why would you even bother to carry this backup system if you don't need it? And that's because the fly-by-wire airplane brings its own benefits, which making the plane significantly lighter because you need a whole lot less cabling, a whole lot less hydraulic fluid and hydraulic lines, and the plane's easier to fly. There's many other benefits. In fact, I will put a link in the description for you so that you can learn more about the fly-by-wire system. 
So let's get back to the story. The time is 626 UTC. The second engine has just flamed out and as that engine spools down, the lights in the cabin begin to flicker, eventually going out, flipping on the emergency lights. The flight director is also giving instructions over the PA system for ditching this plane because we've got 65 miles of nothing but ocean between us and the nearest place to land. So this is a pretty scary moment for the passengers. In fact, your ears are probably starting to pop at this point because the cabin is slowly losing pressurization. And just five minutes after the second engine goes out, the oxygen mask falls from the ceiling. And now you've got to breathe through this oxygen mask. Thanks to the Ram Air turbine kicking in, the pilots are able to keep the plane level and controlled as they approach the airport. In fact, we end up with the opposite problem when we reach the airport. We're a little bit too high. The pilots actually circle around doing a full 360 degree turn. The airplane's coming in a little bit too fast and a little bit too steep. In fact, it hits the runway so hard, it actually bounces up and flies another 1,600-ish feet before it hits the ground again. Because we're not flying with engine power, some of our systems aren't working, including the anti-skid system. So the pilots were forced to give full braking power, which caused the tires to lock up and this plane slid down the runway, quickly tearing off the tires, destroying the rims, and actually starting a few small fires on the runway. Of course, the rescue teams were notified ahead of time and they were out on the runway, ready to put those fires out which was done very quickly. This plane has taken a lot of damage and the danger is not over yet. The pilots quickly call for an emergency evacuation and the flight attendants do exactly that very quickly. The slides go out and they start evacuating passengers. One of the things that I found really interesting about this story is that there were some delays getting passengers off the plane because they had passengers actually trying to bring their luggage with them. Now I tried to put myself in this situation and I wondered, would I try to take my bag? I think I could leave the bag if it was in the overhead compartment, but if it was like between my feet and I was already able, if I could just grab it and go with it, I think I'd try to take my bag with me. But this for you and for me is a reminder, just leave your stuff. It's just stuff. Your life and the 200 plus people you've got with you, their lives are much more important than what's in that bag. And by the way, the plane may not blow up and destroy your stuff. We can get it later. Let's leave it for now, okay? This is for you and for me. Leave your bag. There were two passengers who needed some assistance. There was an elderly gentleman with a cane as well as the paraplegic gentleman we mentioned earlier. Otherwise, the evacuation went well. Of the 306 total people on this plane, only two people had serious injuries that occurred during the evacuation. And I think that's amazing. If this airplane wasn't designed with exactly this scenario in mind, we could be looking for 306 people out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Today's video is part two in a whole series of videos I'm working on related to aircraft engineering. So depending upon when you're clicking on this, there might be a pretty substantial playlist that'll pop up here in just a moment for you to see more videos related to this topic. But also you can help me with this. If you've got an idea related to aircraft and you think it will make for an interesting video, I'd love to hear about it down in the comment section. If you are a pilot, you work in maintenance, you are an aircraft engineer, you guys have access to manuals and you have a wealth of knowledge I would love to hear from you. And finally, I wanna say thank you so much to my patrons because you are the ones that these fine people scrolling on the screen here, these are the people who allow me to invest so many engineering hours into learning about these different mechanisms and uh, being able to present engineering in an interesting way. Hopefully, I wanna persuade more young people to get excited about this thing that I'm excited about. Supporting this work as a patron is yet another way that you can help me to move this mission forward. Okay. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.